Okay, so uh, I am uh, presenting, doing this presentation about uh, about Misra C. This was prepared uh, jointly with uh, uh, a couple of colleagues uh, who work with me uh, in uh, Bagseng. Bagseng uh, is a company, so I, I have to declare a first conflict of interest, which is I am a professor of computer science uh, at the University of Parma, but uh, I also direct this uh, company, which is a spin-off of the university. And I say it uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, you know that uh, I have uh, an interest. However, I will say nothing about the company on about the tool that we produce. So it's just for uh, complete uh, disclosure uh, uh, with respect to you. Uh, so here is the outline of the presentation. So we'll go through some important aspect of the C language. Then I will uh, uh, introduce Ms. Rossi and, uh, and then I will uh, 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 deal with a couple of uh, points that are very important about a uh, proper understanding of Misra C and what, in my opinion, is important for a successful adoption of Misra C. I will then draw some conclusion. So, disclaimer I am a member of the Misra C working group and also of WG14, which is the uh, working group of ISO that standardizes the C programming language. However, both groups have official ways to communicate with the public. And so uh, you have to take all what I say, um, uh, not as the official position of, uh, of the group, I am speaking in a personal capacity here. So first question, do you want to reason about your programs? Do you want to program in assembly or do you want to do so in C? I take it for granted that uh, you want uh, to do to program in C and you want to uh, reason about your programs in C. Otherwise, you are in the wrong webinar. Okay, so let's start with the C language. Uh, the C language uh, is uh, today, after almost 50 years from its inception, uh, the most used programming language, especially in the uh, embedded system field. Uh, there are very strong economical reasons for this success. First of all, C compilers exist for almost any processor, uh, from tiny devices to supercomputer. Uh, C compiler code is very efficient and without hidden costs. And by this, I mean that setting aside uh, the problem of multi-core architecture, a C programmer, by looking at a piece of code, more or less as a way to guess what might be the running time. C allows writing compact code. There is a large uh, offer of built-in operators, so you can write quite complex things with limited verbosity. It is a language defined by an ISO standard. And possibly using language extension, C allows easy access to the hardware, which is essential for embedded system programming. C also has a long history of usage, including in critical systems, and uh, it is widely supported by tools. So these are very strong reasons. Many of those will not go away tomorrow. So C is going to stay with us uh, for several years to come, I would say. So um, the Working Group 14, which standardizes C, has always been faithful uh, to the original spirit of the language. Uh, and joking a little bit, uh, the spirit of the language can be resumed with this commandment. So trust the programmer, let the programmer do anything, uh, speed is what, is, is what matters, and, and many of these things are bad for safety and for security. So let us try to understand uh, where the problems come from. So the majority of the problems come from the notion of behavior. That according to the ISO standard, here I am citing uh, um, C99, but the same is true for all versions of the language, is uh, the notion of behavior. And uh, behavior is anything that is externally visible. If it is not visible from the outside, then it's not a behavior. And due to this, uh, the compiler can systematically uh, uh, 
profit from the so-called as if rule, which means the compiler has the right to do any transformation that preserves uh, the observable behavior. Of course, this is not just uh, true for C, it is true for several other languages. In general, it is true for all languages that admit uh, an optimized compilation implementation. Because in the as if rule, uh, reside uh, most opportunities for optimization. So there are uh, several kinds of behavior which are dangerous in the C programming languages. The first category is called undefined behavior. We have undefined behavior when we use a non-portable or erroneous program construct or erroneous data. And in this case, the standard does not impose any requirement, meaning that absolutely anything can happen. Crashing, erratic behavior of any kind, and even formatting the hard disk, okay? So this is a bit of an exaggeration, but technically speaking, it's true. So it may format your hard disk in given certain circumstances. And uh, what really happens is that the compiler assumes undefined behavior does not happen. It is the responsibility of the programmer to make sure it does not happen. If it does happen, it's, it's the fault of the programmer. The programmer has violated the contract and so there is no warranty whatsoever. So let's see a first example of undefined behavior. It is undefined behavior when a program attempts to modify a string literal. So here we have an example program. Of course, uh, the examples uh, I make uh, in this talk uh, uh, have to be simple, so uh, they are uh, made up if you want. Uh, however, I think they serve uh, the purpose of illustrating the point. Here we have a string literal, which is hello with three exclamation marks. And the programmer decides that three exclamation marks is a bit too much. So uh, what the programmer does is writing a string terminator in position six, so that uh, only one question mark would uh, remain in the intention. However, this is undefined behavior. So in reality, anything can happen. Okay, why this? Because uh, we will see another reason, because uh, the string literal may reside in read-only memory. And uh, trying to write to read-only memory may result uh, in an other exception that from the language point of view is completely undefined. Anything can happen. Another example is when uh, you try to read uh, from uh, an object uh, whose value is still indeterminate, uh, uh, such as uh, a, a variable on the stack, so uh, an object with automatic storage duration that has not been initialized. So the this is undefined behavior for, for several reasons. One of the reasons is that the uh, C standard uh, allows for uh, the presence of trap representations. A trap representation is a bit pattern in memory such that any attempt to read it uh, on the part of the processor will result uh, into maybe another exception. So this is, for example, the case uh, with some implementations of memory with parity or other error detection and correction codes. So here we have an example. Uh, the variable a is, uh, um, uh, is sorry, is an automatic storage uh, variable which is not initialized. It is, uh, uh, it occurs uh, in the guard of the if then else, so it is read and this is undefined behavior. Another category of uh, uh, dangerous behavior is unspecified behavior. We have unspecified behavior when there are two or more choices to do one thing, and the standard uh, does not impose any constraint on which one it is chosen. So the compiler has not uh, even to document it, and uh, it, it doesn't have to be consistent with the choice. So let's make an example. One example of unspecified behavior is the order in which sub-expressions are evaluated in an expression. So in the example, we have an expression involving the plus operator. 
So we have uh, hello plus word. So two function calls. What's the problem here? The problem is that it is unspecified whether hello will be called first or second. So the output of the program might be hello word, which uh, is probably what the programmer intended, but it can also be word exclamation mark hello blank which is probably not what uh, the programmer wanted, but this is perfectly possible. Notice that uh, uh, I could complicate the example by evaluating this expression, say, five times, and there is no obligation whatsoever for the compiler to be consistent. So it may call first hello in the first occurrence and call hello second in the second occurrence. And, uh, it can do one thing with optimizations turned on and do the other thing when optimization are turned off. And, and similarly for any other compile time option, it can change the behavior in ways that are not predictable by the programmer. The third category of non-completely non -completely defined behavior is implementation defined behavior. Everybody knows that because uh, everybody knows that uh, there are implementation of C for 16-bit machines where int uh, are 16 bits and uh, implementation with 32-bit int. So the sizes of the basic data types are all implementation defined. There are many other aspects uh, that are implementation defined. In C99, there are 112 of them. And uh, here is another example. It is implementation defined whether a plain char, a plain char means uh, uh, char without uh, the specification signed or unsigned. So it is uh, implementation defined whether it is signed or not. And uh, this program, uh, explores this by using the char min uh, standard macro, which is provided by the standard header file limits.h. If the minimal value for a plain char is zero, then uh, we have an implementation where plain charts are unsigned and otherwise they are signed. Okay, so why is C not fully defined? Why we have all these behaviors uh, which are not uh, completely defined? Uh, sorry, I, I, I forgot to say one thing. Implementation defined behavior is the least dangerous of, 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 of all those because it has to be implemented. Uh, sorry, it has to be documented by the implementation and its relationship with uh, um, the compiler options should be documented. So this is predictable. Uh, you look into the compiler manual and you can see uh, how each of the implementation defined an aspect of languages of the language are defined by this compiler with uh, uh, the given uh, compile, uh, compiler options. So, um, why do we have all this behavior which is not completely defined? And, and we have uh, skipped completely local specific behavior, which is uh, not very important for, uh, for today's presentation, but there is a further category. And the reason is basically because implementing compilers is easier, and most importantly, because efficient compilers is easier. So let us uh, explore this. Um, Another kind of uh, undefined behavior is uh, when an exceptional condition occurs during the evaluation of an expression. So uh, if you look into the standard, you will see that there, are, uh, there is a definition for exceptional condition. And for what I want to say here, an exceptional condition is, for example, when we have an overflow in the evaluation of uh, signed integers. So, let us suppose uh, we have this function. This function was written by someone thinking in assembly and not thinking in C. In assembly, this would be a sensible way to detect whether the value passed into variable V is the maximum integer. So the reason is 
uh, if you know how assembly works, uh, if V is a maximum possible value and you increment it by one, you will get uh, the, the most negative value and so uh, you will return one. And in all other cases, you will return zero. However, this is not the way uh, C is defined. V plus one is undefined behavior if V is the maximum uh, positive integer. So the compiler can, and in many cases will, compile this function as if it was a non-conditional return zero, because the compiler assumes V plus one does not overflow. Another example, we have already seen this undefined behavior. Uh, the program attempts to modify a string literal. So uh, here we see another reason why. Uh, the reason is this, um, uh, the compiler uh, has the freedom of merging the memory representation of string literals. For example, if we have, if we have two literals in a program, one is tail and the other is head tail, then the compiler can store in memory just head tail and use a pointer to the fifth character when it needs uh, a representation for tail. So what happens that if you change one string, you change also the other. The point is that the compiler can assume that you will never do this. Okay, so that's why the compiler um, can safely do this optimization. Uh, summarizing about writing uh, uh, to string literals, we have seen two reasons. So one possibility, the literals are stored in two read-only memory. So when you try to write to them, you will end up with, uh, you don't know what, maybe another exception, maybe it will work, you don't know. And um, if uh, you succeed in writing this memory, then you think you have modified one string literal, and in reality, you have modified perhaps uh, two of them or, or, or even more of them. Let us uh, see another example. So the behavior is undefined when an expression is shifted by a negative number or by an amount greater than or equal to the width of the promoted expression. So let's start from the first bit, shifting by a negative number. So what might it mean shifting uh, a quantity left by minus three position? It might mean uh, shifting it right by three positions. However, this is not the way the C language has been designed. The spirit of the language is if you want to play with negative shift counts, you write the code to check whether the shift count is negative and you take appropriate action. The compiler will not insert in the executable code every time you do a shift, a test for, for the sign and maybe reversing the the uh, shift direction. It is a little bit uh, less obvious why might be a problem shifting 32-bit quantities, 32 positions to the left. Uh, thinking in, one might think, uh, what is the problem? If I push 32 or more zeros from the right-hand side, the result should be zero because all the bits would uh, uh, fall off the left-hand side? No. And why is this? Because uh, in, the, in very popular architectures, such as Intel 64 or IA32, the first thing that happened to the shift count is that it is masked. Only the uh, low order five bits are retained. And why is this? Because they want to uh, have a strict bound on the maximum execution time of a shift operation. So there is this masking, and this means that on these machines, uh, shifting by 32 is the same as shifting by 32 masked, which is the same as shifting by zero position, which is the same as doing nothing. So again, C leaves this behavior undefined for speed and ease of implementation. This is the spirit of the language. Anytime it is possible, a high level construct should be mapped to one machine instructions. Okay, so and since there is variability between machine uh, and machine, uh, 
aspects of the language are left uh, not completely defined. Okay, so is this, uh, this was a poll for, for another presentation, so don't, um, um, you, you have already answered, uh, answered uh, to this. So uh, this uh, um, uh, presentation is based on a paper that I presented uh, last year at Embedded World. So maybe some of you was present, I don't know. And in any case, uh, uh, I will send the paper to uh, Stanislav so he can send it to the attendees. Okay, so uh, let's uh, talk about MISRA. MISRA is a project. MISRA is more than MISRA C. The MISRA project started in 1990 uh, as, as part of the of a. Um, program funded by the UK government, it was, it was called Safe IT. It is now self-supported and there is a company that provides the project management support. So basically selling uh, uh, copies of the standard and paying for uh, uh, the meeting rooms uh, used by the working group. These are the two first uh, uh, MISRA publication. Uh, the first one on the left uh, are the development guidelines for vehicle-based software. MISRA started in the motor industry. And uh, this uh, publication is remarkable because it was published more than 10 years before work started on ISO 26262. And the second uh, publication uh, displayed uh, on the right, uh, it's uh, the first version of the MISRA C coding standard, when it was uh, still referring to vehicle-based software, so to, uh, to the automotive sector. Uh, here is uh, the uh, picture uh, uh, showing a little bit of the history of uh, MISRA C and MISRA C++. So initially, there were Ford and Rover that were developing their in-house uh, um, uh, coding standards for uh, the C language. They joined forces uh, uh, under the umbrella of the MISRA project to produce uh, MISRA C 1998, which uh, influenced basically all the coding standards for C and C++ that were developed uh, uh, afterwards. And uh, uh, starting from MISRA C 2004, any reference to the motor industry, to the automotive sector was uh, dropped. The MISRA standard is uh, um, uh, valid for any industry sector. So we are now at in MISRA C 2012, and this is what uh, we will talk about now. So before uh, introducing uh, MISRA C 2012, uh, it is important to understand uh, one thing, that the weakness of the C language comes from its strengths. So for any uh, good point, there is a matching bad point. The fact that it is relatively easy to write efficient compilers for almost any architecture, as we have seen, is one of the main reasons behind non-definite behavior. The fact that uh, it is possible to write efficient code with no hidden costs is because there is no runtime error checking at all. You code the error checking if you want it. The fact that there are many compilers, there are today around 1,000 compilers in actual use, and the, language, uh, the fact that the language is defined by an ISO standard is another reason behind non-definite behavior. So, if two existing compilers do the same thing in different ways, the only way forward may be to leave some behavior non-completely defined. Okay, you cannot say to an established vendor of C compilers that uh, starting from next version, your compiler will no longer be called the C compiler. The fact that uh, it is easy to access the hardware it is the same reason why it is easy to corrupt the program state. For example, you can overwrite the stack very easily. The fact that uh, you can write compact code uh, uh, using the same uh, features, uh, you can also write completely obscure code and uh, uh, code that your colleagues and yourself, maybe one month from now, will not understand. So. 
what is the solution? Since we cannot separate easily the good aspect from the bad aspects, so the solution is language subsetting. Okay, language subsetting means we do not program our applications in C, we use a subset of C. And the language subsetting is mandated or recommended by all safety and security related industrial standards. I have listed a few of them. And we are talking about MISRA C because MISRA C is today the most authoritative language subset for the C programming language. Okay, so um, I now present uh, how MISRA C looks like. It's uh, contained into uh, a collection of guidelines. Guidelines are presented in the way I'm showing now. First, the guideline is introduced with a pink strip. On the left-hand side, there is a unique identifier for the guideline. The unique identifier is composed by a word that may be rule or directive, followed by a dot decimal sub-identifier. So together, the word rule and the um, uh, decimal uh, identifier constitute a unique identifier. And then on the right hand side of the strip, uh, we have uh, what is called the headline of the guideline. Okay. So let's uh, uh, explain what is a directive and what is a rule. A directive is a guideline such that information concerning compliance is not fully contained in the source code and in the language implementation. In order to decide uh, if you have compliance, uh, you should take into account in general also specifications, designs, and in some cases also the programmer intentions. Whereas when a guideline is called a rule, then information about compliance is fully contained in the source code and in the language implementation. Okay. The source code alone means nothing in C. In, the C uh, in order to understand the piece of code, you have to also know the implementation. A consequence is that for directives, static analysis tools may assist in checking compliance, provided you supply them with the information, the extra information they require, the information that is not contained in the source code or in the language implementation. Whereas for a rule, modulo and decidability, a static analysis tool in principle can, can be capable of checking compliance, okay? Good, now the headline. What has to be understood is that the headline is just a short summary of the guideline. The headline is not the guideline. Many people think that uh, they, they just read the headline. Uh, and then they think they have understood the, the guideline and this is not true. So in order to properly understand the guideline, you have to read the full description, which is uh, maybe one page, two pages, or even three pages long. So below the, the pink strip, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are three attributes uh, for the guideline. One is category, uh, which can be mandatory, required, or advisory. Then there is analysis, uh, which is an attribute constituted by a pair. So the decidability can be decidable or undecidable. And the second component of the pair is, can be system or single translation unit. And uh, uh, the third attribute is a set of uh, language uh, versions. So C19, C99. And these slides have not been updated, but, but since uh, um, uh, the 20 something of February, now we have uh, MISRA C 2012 Amendment 2, which extends uh, support uh, also to C11 and C18. Okay, so a guideline is, uh, is tagged uh, as category mandatory if you have to comply, full stop. So it's not possible to deviate. If the category is required, then you have to comply or to formally deviate the guideline. To formally deviate the guideline means that you have to write a deviation report where you explain 
why the thing, uh, why uh, the fact that you are not complying is necessary, why it is safe, uh, whether uh, you will do extra activities in order to make sure that it is safe, for example, extra testing and so on. The third category is advisory. Advisory guidelines are just recommendations. They should be followed as far as it is reasonably practical. practical uh, you need not to formally deviate, but at the end of the project, if you want to claim MISRA compliance, you have uh, to list all non-compliances. You don't have to justify them, but you have to list them. Uh, an important thing to understand is that there is no other grading of importance. So it is not true, for example, that uh, directives are more important than rules or the other way around. So mandatory are the most important, required come uh, afterwards and then advisory. I am, of course, simplifying things a little bit in order to, to, to stay into the, the time. And I, I see that I am late. So. MISRA rules, uh, guideline, uh, sorry, rules are, are uh, classified uh, to be decidable or undecidable. So when they are market decidable, it means there, is, there exists an algorithm that for each source program, given enough resources, we always produce a yes or no answer in finite time. Whereas if the rule is market undecidable, then such an algorithm does not and will never exist. So it is a fundamental. Uh, computability results that there are that most interesting program properties are undecidable. For example, division by zero is undecidable, buffer overflow are undecidable. All the properties that depend on the uh, value at runtime of uh, modifiable objects uh, are undecidable. All the properties that depend on the reachability of a certain program points are undecidable. Of course, uh, even though the rule is uh, classified as decidable, the limitation of available resources might prevent the use of exact algorithm. Maybe decidable, but say the, the best algorithm is cubic on the number of lines of the program, well, it's too much. Okay, then uh, the scope of the analysis, uh, rules are classified according to the amount of code that needs to be analyzed, in particular, if a guideline is marked as single translation unit, then it means that you can detect all the violation in a project by checking each translation unit at a time. A translation unit is, uh, say, a .c file along with all the header files uh, that it includes. And uh, otherwise, uh, the rule will be marked system, which means that uh, Considering one translation unit at a time is not sufficient, you will have to check more than one translation unit at a time. And um, the, the most common case, you will have to consider the entire project in order to find all violation of the rule. Okay, then uh, after these attributes, uh, uh, we have a section which is called amplification. This is a more precise description of the guideline and this is normative so whenever you think that uh, there is a conflict between uh, the amplification and the headline well it's amplification that wins as i said the headline is just uh, a reminder of what the rule is about then there is a section about the rationale so explaining why the rule exists for example for avoiding uh, uh, undefined behavior uh, sometimes there are rules uh, that do not apply in certain cases, and these cases uh, are described in a section uh, titled exception. There always are examples, both a positive example and negative examples. Uh, when uh, rules are related to one another, sorry, when guidelines are related to one another, then there is a see also sections section with the reference. There are other kinds of references uh, uh, in uh, uh, the description, and these are situated um, below the pink strip uh, on the right-hand side. And these are usually references to the language standards. For example, here we are looking at Directive 1.1 which has to do with implementation defined behavior. And for C90, it uh, refers to Annex G3, which is where all the 
uh, implementation defined behaviors are uh, listed in C90 and the same for C99 where they are listed in Annex J.3. So here you can get uh, uh, a, a, a clear explanation of what is a directive. You can see that this is not checkable completely by machine. So any implementation defined behavior on which the output of the program depends, this part is checkable by machine. So we can have algorithms that detect which implementation defined behavior may or definitely influence the uh, behavior of the program. Uh, however, this behavior must be documented and understood. So of course, the, the static analysis tool cannot know if you have properly documented them and uh, uh, let alone if you uh, understand them. Okay. So let's uh, have a, a couple of examples, uh, two or three examples, I'm late, I'm bloody late, uh, of uh, guidelines. So first is rule 1.1. The program shall, not, shall, shall contain no violation of the standard C syntax and constraint and shall not exceed the implementation translation limit. It's a required rule, it's decidable, it's single translation unit and it applies to all versions of the language. This might be surprising to someone. So one might think, uh, isn't it the job of the compiler to uh, warn me if I am exceeding, uh, uh, if I'm going beyond the standard C syntax or if I am violating a constraint? And uh, the, the reason is no. Uh, it's no, because uh, a conforming implementation, so a conforming compiler, does not need to generate a diagnostic when a translation limit is exceeded. What is a translation limit? Uh, a translation limit is uh, a quantity for which there is a minimal uh, uh, amount, uh, uh, and uh, until uh, that amount, uh, guarantees are given, and beyond that point, uh, guarantees are no longer given. For example, how deeply can you nest uh, the uh, preprocessor uh, conditional uh, compilation directives? Sharp if, sharp if def, and similar. Well, uh, in, I'm going by heart, so, but in C90, uh, a C compiler to call, if you want to call it a C compiler, must support nine, a nesting level up to nine but no guarantees are done beyond that. So, and the compiler has no obligation to issue a, to generate a diagnostic, to give a warning or, or to give an error if you exceed the limit. Similar things for the significant parts of identifiers. So if you write uh, um, the, Identifiers uh, have a significant part and the part that is not significant. Uh, for example, in C99, for a variable, the compiler must ensure that the, the, the two identifiers uh, uh, that um, uh, are uh, different, uh, uh, sorry, must ensure at least 31 characters uh, of significance case sensitive for identifiers. So if you have two identifiers that are different, but they differ uh, not in the first 31 characters, then the compiler might treat them uh, as the same identifier or as different identifier. And uh, the compiler has no obligation to give you a warning or an error. And notice also that there are several uh, compilers around there that uh, even do not diagnose constant violation. So they do not provide an error. They compile things they should not compile. And uh, what is the behavior of the code they generate? You don't know. So that's why it is important to have a separate tool to check uh, that uh, uh, you are not exceeding uh, uh, the language. There are several other reasons why this uh, rule is important. For example, that if you use uh, something that is outside C, well, Misra C was not designed with those things in mind, so they are not covered. Another 
uh, reason is uh, if you need to qualify your compiler and in, in safety critical uh, settings you will have to qualify your compiler you should know that the qualification suite so the, the huge test of program the huge set of programs that you will uh, use to qualify the compiler has been written only with the standard features in mind so they will not check what uh, your compiler does outside uh, the standard. Um, another rule, so this one is about comments. Uh, I have chosen this rule because some people think, uh, hey, pff, what might be the problem with comments? Well, there are problems with comments. Uh, in particular, there are problems uh, about uh, nesting the comments, uh, which is uh, uh, tricky. Uh, for example, mixing slash star star slash comment with double slash comments and here we are showing uh, another issue so the interplay between double slash comments and line splicing so here is an example so the programmer uh, wrote a comment and the intention was uh, that the final part of the comment was representing a, a, a file path in uh, windows syntax however the last character of this line is a backslash, so this is called line splicing. And what happens in the translation phase of C is that uh, physical source lines are joined into logical source lines. So it is as if critical function, this function call, was written just after SRC, meaning that critical function is commented out. So this function is critical but it will not be called. Actually, the uh, subsequent steps of the compiler will not even see the call. They will see nothing, okay? And so this is something that can happen uh, in a way that is completely um, unsuspected by the programmer. So this is why, another reason why you need a tool to, to, to warn you about this. Rule 11.4, this is advisory. A conversion should not be performed between a pointer to object and an integer type. Why is this? Because integer to pointer conversion have, uh, they are all uh, implementation defined, but they have also undefined behavior associated with them. So uh, if the pointer is not wide enough, you may have truncation, you may generate a misaligned pointer. So if you try to dereference it, uh, bad things may happen and also pointer to integer conversion have problems of course it is recognized that you need integer to pointer conversions when you need to uh, access uh, memory mapped registers or other other features which is often the case uh, in uh, embedded system programming really go back to this uh, to this point uh, so I'm, I'm late and uh, this is rule 13.2, it's required, it's about uh, um, unspecified and undefined behavior. It says the value of an expression and its persistent side effects shall be the same under all permitted evaluation order. This is required, it's undecidable and it's a system, so you need to analyze the entire system if you want to find uh, um, uh, all the violation actually in general you cannot find all the violation because it is undecidable but if you want to uh, at least have a chance you have to examine the entire system so between two sequence points the evaluation order is unspecified this one problem we will see in the example but in addition there are also situations uh, that can lead to undefined behavior for example when you modify an object more than once between two sequence points. It's undefined behavior. So if you write something like A++ plus plus A++, plus plus, this is undefined behavior. Okay, here is the example about unspecified behavior. Here we are, uh, um, one uh, uh, behavior that is unspecified is the order in which the arguments to a function call will be evaluated. And in this case, since they are volatile objects, they may trigger side effects. And so uh, we, the code is this, we are not sure which side effect is triggered first. So in order to comply to the rule, we have to introduce, uh, for example, one would be sufficient, but in this case, we introduce uh, two 
uh, temporary variables uh, and this way we sequentialize uh, the side effects uh, the way we want okay no decent compiler will let you pay any price for having introduced these two temporary variables okay so understanding misra c misra c is part of a process okay so it means that misra c is not just a tool okay misra c is part of a documented software development process that has many requirements in particular you should have software requirements you should have specifications you, the specification should have been evaluated you have to test uh, the modules produced in a certain way and so on uh, the uh, the important thing is that uh, misra c should be used before the code reaches the review and unit testing phases otherwise uh, if you as it is unfortunately often the case if misra c is uh, you think about misra c at the end of the project then you have to be prepared to do a lot of rework and retesting so you have done already test uh, and review and you in order to be compliant to misra c you have to change the code you have to redo the review uh, uh, at least in part and you have to redo the testing so the requirements for safety related development uh, are outside the scope of misra c the, uh, the the full requirements are in uh, each uh, functional safety standard okay so uh no this was uh, in, uh, about another uh, webinar which uh, has already taken place by the way so um the thing that uh, i want to say now is that uh, um, misra c has very little to do with bug finding so many people especially those who don't know misra c well confuse it with bug finding uh, in, in as i said uh, misra c is part of a documented software development process uh, to start with the violation of a guideline is not necessarily a software error for example there is nothing intrinsically wrong in converting an integer constant to a pointer when you need this to access uh, memory mapped uh, registers okay however as i said such conversions are implementation defined and there are in undefined behavior associated to them so rule 11.4 suggests avoiding them everywhere apart from the very specific cases where you need it the point is not uh, you should not do that okay the deviation part is an essential uh, ingredient of misra c okay the point is look this is dangerous you may only do this if it is needed if it is safe and if you can easily and quickly convince your peer that it is both needed and safe okay uh, if it takes half an hour to understand that uh, a certain thing uh, is is no problem it's too much it's it's way too much it should be obvious that the code is correct okay uh, one useful way to think about misra c is uh, to think about it uh, as an effective way of conducting a guided peer review so in a real peer review you would be sitting with your colleagues in front of a big screen and you would point fingers at the screen saying are you sure here we are not running into trouble well with misra c and with the tool of course uh, you can do this peer review uh, and this is very effective to rule out most of the c language traps and pitfalls in particular the uh, non-completely defined behaviors so uh, misra c has very little to do with bug finding another uh, uh, reason for this is that if you look at bug finders you will see that bug finder are usually tolerant about false negatives and intolerant about false positives if you follow the development of gcc and of clang as i do you will see that as soon as they receive a false positive report they will do everything to remove the false positive and without any consideration whether they are introducing false negatives false negatives is when there is a problem in the code but the tool is silent about it and this is not the right mindset 
for checking compliance with respect to MISO C. Okay. It's true, false positive are a nuisance because you have to analyze them. And in the end, maybe you discover that they are false positive and not true positives. But if a tool has false negative, this means that you have to use other methods in order to ensure compliance. So another aspect that places miseracy in a different, uh, completely different uh, point of view than bug finding is the importance of miseracy assigns to reviews, code reviews, reviews of the code, reviews of the design documents. And in fact, there are many misery rules that have to do with code readability and understandability. People who use bug finders, they, uh, they usually have a very different mindset. They, th they, they want to program as they want with no constraint at all. Let me write the way I want. And then uh, the, the bug finder will find some bugs. Okay. So uh, I'm near to the conclusion. Successful adoption of Misra C. I will skip slides here. It is, of course, entirely possible to manually verify uh, code for compliance with Misra C. Of course, this cost is enormous, so you have to use tools. And uh, however, there are manual activities that remain. So you have to configure the tool at the beginning, and then uh, you have uh, configure your deviations. So when you decide that you will deviate the rule in a certain context, you will have to instruct the tool about your intention. Okay, so the first aspect uh, is, is, is not so easy because in C99, as I said, there are 112 implementation defined behaviors. So by definition, an implementation defined behaviors can be defined in two or more ways. So the number of languages is enormous, even with this uh, very rough estimation. Actually, it is easy to improve a little bit the estimation and to see that uh, the number of dialects of C that are legal by the standard is much higher. So much more than the different positions in the Alexander star, which is uh, this uh, more complex uh, version of the Rubik cube. So, and, and, and things are is further complicated by the fact that uh, a single compiler can implement via options several dialects. For example, in the machine which I'm using now, uh, I have GCC for x86-64, and this compiler implements via command line options more than 100,000 dialects of C, okay? As a consequence, if the tool doesn't uh, uh, comply to the uh, implementation defined aspects uh, you are uh, um, depending upon in the compilation of each translation unit, which depends on the compile time option, uh, sorry, on the compiler option you are using, then what may happen is that you uh, have uh, static analysis results that mean absolutely nothing. The static analysis tool is, is interpreting the C code in a way that is different from uh, uh, the way it is interpreted by the compiler with those options, okay? One of these aspects, which is particularly uh, evident, is uh, to do with predefined macros. So all the compilers uh, uh, define some predefined macros and they are typically influenced by compiler options. So the option may be given on the command line, on environment variables, in files. And if you don't capture these predefined variables in the tool uh, correctly, then you end up analyzing uh, the wrong code. Okay, so it's, it's very, very common this, more than you can think. Uh, okay, I have no time to do this. Uh, uh, this may be for another webinar. It's a, a funny exercise where uh, uh, we can show that a very small program that is this one can print hundreds of different th things. Uh, um, uh, can I make uh, a quick comment? We yeah. actually do have time. There is no reason to uh, put any limits, just in case, uh, just say. Okay, so I don't want to, <laughs> okay. So, well, uh, yes, um, I, can, uh, I can send you, I can send to Stanislav a, a small paper. So, uh, uh, 
a small paper on uh, on on this. Uh, so it it's a five pages paper, which shows that uh, this thing of the um, implementation of the final aspect is very real. So it takes uh, a program that is less than 700 characters long, and there are uh, uh, more than 700 uh, ways of compiling it with the same compiler, just changes the compiler option, and this will return here a number, any number you want, from 0 to 767. So this is uh, nice. Uh, but uh, I mean, as I said, it's a five pages nice paper, uh, and I will send it to to Stanislav so that uh, he can send it uh, to you if you are uh, if you are interested. Um, okay, so in theory there are three possibilities. The first possibility is that the static analysis to tool is integrated in the compiler and the linker. Um, it looks good because uh, surely the compiler knows everything about the implementation of the final aspects that uh, uh, the compiler is using in the compilation. However, if you look at them, you will look that you will see that such tools are not very good. Actually, they are usually very, very bad. And for, for some reasons which have to do with the fact that they have a limited audience, uh, only the people using uh, uh, that particular two chain uh, limited investments were done to develop them, so consequently they received limited testing and uh, another reason a more fundamental reason is that uh, they reuse for static analysis the same algorithm they use for optimized compilation and such algorithms are governed by heuristics so since uh, the compiler must be reasonably fast, uh, they will uh, use heuristic to speed up compilation time. For example, uh, I don't know, when deciding whether uh, to inline a function or not, if the function is longer than three lines, uh, certain analysis will not even done on it. Okay, so, and so the reason, uh, and this is uh, one of the reasons why if you, if you, uh, um, test these tools, uh, you will see that, uh, that uh, um, they are very bad. They have uh, lots of false positive, lots of false negative. The other possibility is that uh, you uh, uh, are in charge, the user is in charge of carefully configuring the tool, taking into, into account all the implementation of the final aspect. It's very error prone. And uh, if someone changes the compiler options used uh, uh, in the project, then you have to redo the configuration. Not to forget that uh, in the same project, uh, you may use different compile options for different parts of the code. Okay, so this is not something that you can do per project in some projects. Uh, the third possibility is that the tool is smart enough. So the tool, uh, automatically extracts the required information from the tool chain. Okay, this is of course by far the best possibility. So it has to be taken into account because the other two are not very, very uh, attractive. So I will, uh, I will skip uh, this one or not, uh, maybe not. Uh, okay, another thing to be taken into account when you consider static analysis tools, uh, is uh, that um, uh, some tools uh, uh, cover many, many coding standards. Uh, so basically all of them. And uh, the way they do this uh, often is that they have a quite big collection of micro checkers, which uh, they um, combine together in order to cover uh, different coding standards. So not just the MISRA coding standards, but also other coding standards. The point is that the juxtaposition of this micro checker is uh, quite often inexact. So here is an example. Suppose that the oval shape is uh, the MISRA guideline and the two red pieces are micro checkers. You can see that uh, there are there is red stuff outside the oval, and these are false positives. And you can see that there is white stuff inside the oval, and this is uh, 
these are false negatives. So this is something you have to pay attention. Um, last important thing, the importance of training. So staff competence is a crucial requirement in order to uh, uh, rightfully claim uh, uh, compliance for a project. It is explicitly written in the MISRA documents and it is also mandated by uh, uh, the functional safety standards. So there are uh, requirements on the skills of the software team members, including those in charge of using the tools. So the point is that without a proper understanding of, of the C pitfalls and of the MISRA guideline, the developers may, 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 uh, may be brought off track. So they may perceive the adoption of the guidelines as something that has been imposed upon themselves. Uh, they will typically misunderstand the messages output by the tool and don't know what, uh, what should be done because they don't understand the MISRA guideline and maybe they don't understand the issues that the guideline is uh, uh, meant to uh, prevent, they will be unable to recognize false positives given by the tool. And in the worst possible scenario, they will start changing the code by trial and error. So change the code, uh, reanalyze, uh, see if the warning went away. It didn't go away, so change the code again. And, uh, and doing this, what may happen? is that the code quality may decrease. Okay, so conclusion. C is the most used language uh, for the programming of embedded systems. Uh, the, the, C, the language has several advantages which are uh, countered by uh, disadvantages. So uh, these disadvantages have a severe impact on safety and security requirements. So language subsetting is crucial. I have explained uh, uh, a little bit of MISRA C, uh, and uh, in my opinion, MISRA C is the most authoritative subset of C for the development of high integrity embedded systems. MISRA C is part of the software development process. It has very little to do with bug finding, and uh, the use of good tools and proper formal training of personnel is what it takes to have a smooth and successful adoption of MISRA C into an organization. And uh, I am ready for your questions. So I guess I should now uh, uh, stop sharing of the screen uh, and um, I should uh, I should uh, uh, look at the chat. Okay, so this is a, a classical question. There is a MISRA rule saying that uh, um, every function should have a single point uh, of uh, return. And uh, this uh, is very controversial because there are good uh, arguments uh, for uh, the opposite rule, so saying that you should return as early as possible. So why is this in MISRA uh, C? And the reason it is in MISRA C is, uh, is uh, because it is in two, in at least two functional safety standards. One is uh, IEC 61508, which explicitly mentioned this, and the other is ISO 26262, so the functional safety standard for the automotive sector. Okay, they explicitly mention this, so it is not uh, at all easy to remove this uh, uh, guideline for MISRA C. However, uh, there are several attempts to do this, uh, and in particular, um, concerning IEC 61508, which is undergoing a, a stage of revision. There are several groups uh, and, and uh, this, uh, one of these groups uh, uh, has also an intersection with uh, the MISRA C and C++ working group that are asking the um, uh, committee in charge of revising 61508 to 
uh, reformulate uh, or to uh, or to remove this requirement. In fact, this requirement should probably have never been there. So the reason it was uh, uh, put there was probably because Fortran, Fortran allowed functions to uh, have uh, different entry points and different exit point. And by exit point, I do not mean that they, they may return early, that they may return to a place that is different from the call site, okay? So this was most likely the original reason why the requirement was put into IEC 61508. So it will not be easy anyway. Uh, it's not uh, a mandatory rule. Only few MISRA rules are mandatory. So you cannot deviate from them. This is a required rule. So it's perfectly possible. And in some environment, it is even sensible to deviate this rule globally for a project. Okay. There are rational grounds, uh, and, and, uh, and since you asked the question, you, you know them, rational grounds to deviate it and to defend the choice in front of a certification authority or of an assessor. Okay, thanks for the appreciation of the talk. Let me see. Um, okay. So, uh, in, okay, the question is, uh, if I believe in some kind of gradual adoption of MISRA C in non-MISRA compatible code base, so gradual refactoring. Um, so let me see. Uh, the MISRA document itself uh, advises not to impose MISRA C compliance upon an existing project uh, that has uh, already a, a service history, a good service history that has been tested. So uh, imposing MISRA C compliance upon such a may be counterproductive. So it is not uh, a, a, in general uh, something you should feel compelled to do. Uh, anyway, so, and here I'm talking about my experience in Bagseng as part of our consulting services. So what uh, happens quite frequently is that there are projects that never had a MISRA requirement or that they were not safety critical or they were not recognized as safety critical. So what uh, uh, happens uh, quite frequently is that uh, someday the MISRA C requirement comes and uh, the, the, uh, um, the group uh, has already a significant code base developed. So um, this uh, can be done. Uh, one must be very careful. So that's why uh, an even uh, um, uh, deeper, knowledge of MISRA C is required. Um, there are uh, uh, prescriptions, there are, sorry, um, in MISRA C, uh, there are uh, special prescriptions that regard the uh, so-called adopted code. Adopted code is legacy code or machine generated code or uh, third party code. Um, so, uh, some simplification is allowed for adopted code. So this is another aspect that you might want to consider. Um, uh, so it has, it has to be done very, very, very carefully. I mean, taking a code that has never been thought with a MISRA compliance, uh, for, for MISRA co compliance, and then uh, to change it in order to be uh, MISRA compliant. It's, uh, it's difficult. So sometimes there is no choice. So sometimes uh, um, the, 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 it is the only thing that you, you can do. Okay, so AutoSAR C++, uh, uh, yes, I am familiar uh, with them. 
so uh, two things uh, there is um, um, also MISRA C++ in addition to MISRA C. MISRA C++ the last version is uh, dated 2008 and uh, um, uh, in 2014 AUTOSAR published uh, the uh, AUTOSAR C++ uh, 2014 guidelines which uh, um, which was something that was done because uh, there was no update of MISRA C for a long time. However, what happened is that uh, now uh, AUTOSAR has uh, agreed uh, with uh, the MISRA project uh, to reconduct uh, the, uh, guide, their guidelines together with MISRA C++. So uh, work is in progress to merge MISRA C++ and AUTOSAR C++. In the end, uh, this will uh, result uh, into uh, a new version of MISRA C++ and there are uh, uh, plans uh, that uh, the first uh, versions uh, for public comments might be out by the end of this year. And um, yeah. I have also asked the, my question. It's uh, right at the uh, right above the last question about. Oh, okay, the... sorry. Uh, okay, the next significant MISRA C update. What are the major changes? Uh, okay, so the, um, uh, there has been, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, one month ago, so at, at the end of February. Uh, the MISRA C working group uh, has published uh, the amendment 2, which is uh, 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 an uh, extension of MISRA C to cover also uh, the um, uh, non emergent parts of C11 and C18. So basically, you can use a C11 and a C18 compiler in a MISRA C in a MISRA C uh, project, but you cannot use uh, the new features. So uh, what uh, the MISRA C working group is uh, working at, there are several things actually. Um, uh, the most important one in my uh, personal opinion is uh, the coverage of uh, the new uh, constructs introduced by C11. Okay, C18 is not considered to be a separate language because uh, uh, essentially C18 uh, does not have any new feature with respect to C11. So uh, technically speaking, C18 is a technical corrigendum of, uh, of C11. So this is the main, uh, the main uh, and, and actually the most urgent development. Uh, uh, the first outcome was, as I said, uh, the uh, publication of Amendment 2. And the idea is to publish uh, uh, incremental uh, 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 updates that will uh, incorporate uh, uh, new parts uh, of, C, of the language C, the ones introduced in C11, one at a time. Okay. Uh, what do I think about Rust? Uh, Rust is a nice language. It has uh, some clever ideas. Uh, however, I don't think we will uh, see uh, Rust uh, anytime soon uh, in uh, critical settings. So for the reasons I have mentioned, so, uh, there are uh, very strong uh, economic reasons behind the adoption of, uh, of C, so it is not easy at all for a new language to take, uh, take its place. Of course, this may happen, but uh, you need a strong user community, you need many tools, uh, you need uh, all the kind of... Uh, efficiency and flexibility that you you have from C. Um, uh, 
Okay, yes. So my opinion about uh, uh, C++ exception uh, is, is, is not positive uh, for the reasons that you are, uh, you are uh, saying. So exceptions complicate very much, uh, very much uh, the control flow of programs and uh, make uh, uh, static analysis significantly more complex. So um, the same thing is true of, uh, of other constructs. For example, uh, many people would like to uh, see the restriction about uh, not using a dynamically allocated memory to go away. So this is not easy. Uh, the point is that the dynamic memory location is complex per se. It's not because, uh, I don't know, uh, of some prejudice uh, on the part of, uh, of the Misra groups or, or other uh, uh, groups. Uh, it's just because if you want to use the dynamic memory location, you have, you have to have a plan for what, what happens when you run out of memory, what you do about memory leaks, uh, what do you do about the variability in the execution time of the memory allocator and the allocator? So if, uh, if you really have good answers to all these questions, then you have the material that you need to write a defensible deviation record for the rule saying you shouldn't use dynamically allocated memory. And if you have this argument, this rational argument, then you can deviate the rule. Okay. Probably one last question, anyone? I think I can ask the last one myself. Uh, okay. Uh, is there, uh, or maybe how does the Misera training usually happen? I, I saw a number of times that uh, some companies, they do training, they teach people how to write safety critical code according to Misera. And what does it actually mean? So do they do some special exercises or what this t teaching actually means? Okay, so uh, I have, uh, I have, uh, I, I don't know exactly how other uh, people do this. So uh, I do teach uh, Misra courses. Uh, I do this uh, um, uh, in the, as part of my activity for the Bugsang company, and I also do it for free for my students. Uh, so it's. Uh, um, a reasonable Misra C course uh, is uh, at least two days. So it's uh, 16 hours of teaching. It's uh, uh, a bit packed like this, but uh, three days uh, is, is often um, uh, not uh, chosen uh, because it's, uh, it's too long. So there are a lot of lectures, uh, of course, uh, and uh, uh, exercises uh, and uh, there are versions of the courses with exams or without exams uh, so it's uh, uh, so but this is uh, not uh, I'm not talking about courses uh, that teach you how to program in C so the the, the courses on Misra C uh, I do teach and I have experience uh, on uh, they are for people who is already very familiar with the language and uh, uh, people who has uh, uh, programmed in C for at least, uh, I don't know, three years, I would say. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for the answer. Uh, I guess we don't have any more questions. So, I thank you, Roberto, for giving us uh, such an interesting and insightful presentation. I think uh, the last thing that I can say uh, as an organizer that we are uh, looking for more uh, speakers. So if you could present something on the topic of software verification, please approach me. 
like Roberto did it, uh, like Oleg did it. He is now on the call too, uh, like Yegor did it. So it's very easy just write me an email. Uh, and with this, I think, uh, have a nice evening. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will certainly attend future meetups um, that are done online, at least. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.